Well, I've always already been greeted once by someone who said, you preached last week, what's wrong? Um, I just want to make you aware, Pastor Matt is fine. Uh, he's on vacation. This year, he uh, moved homes and welcomed his mother into his house. Two of what they say are some of the more stressful things that you can do in your life. And so he, uh, we encouraged him to take a little bit of an extended break, which is what he's doing right now. So I preached last week, I will preach this week, and then next week you'll hear from Nathaniel King, our student ministry director, and then Pastor Matt will return. He is okay. Uh, he, I think he, he got a deer a couple days ago, so he's, you know, that makes his day, so he's fine. I just wanted to make you aware of that. Today we're going to talk about proper footwear. Now, when I say shoes... Different things come to different people's minds. All right, you start thinking about a specific kind of shoe. Uh, there are specific kinds of shoes and specific kinds of footwear that are appropriate for specific kinds of times. Not often do you play soccer in cowboy boots. You don't usually see someone take the floor on an NBA game wearing Crocs. Uh, it would be uncommon to wear your football cleats on the ice rink. There are different times where footwear is appropriate and different times when it is not. Uh, footwear is becoming something important in my house, and it's becoming all the more confusing. This morning, we had just a crisis because we couldn't find someone's shoes. We eventually found some shoes, but they weren't the shoes that matched the outfit, but we made it. Proper footwear is essential. Compounding this issue at my house is that my oldest daughter now has the same size foot as my wife. And so my oldest daughter likes to wear my wife's shoes and then put them in her shoe area. Or I try to help and I put shoes away. I don't know whose shoes are whose anymore. I barely know what shoes I'm wearing. And so I put them into various places where I think they go and I've compounded the issue. Why? Because proper footwear is essential. My wife can't go to school wearing a nine-year-old shoes. Likewise, the nine-year-old or ten-year-old should not wear my wife's shoes to school. My son... Uh, kind of put their shoes away, but more or less one falls down the stairs and one is carried off somewhere else by, you know, the shoe thief, whoever that might be. My youngest daughter likes to put shoes on her feet and on her hands and then gallop around the house and then hide those shoes we don't know where. There's a couple vents that we have that have yet to be covered in our new house and we think she throws shoes down the vent. We'll figure it out one day or we won't. But we have to go to school, we have to go to church, we have to go to work and we have to have the right footwear. Proper footwear is essential. And when we get to the passage that we're at today, Paul is going to talk about the importance of the right kinds of shoes. When, I, when we were planning out who's preaching on what week, I got footwear and I thought, oh good, you know, this will be fun. But I did a lot of looking into this, a lot of studying into this to see that when Paul would say, put on the right shoes, something specific came to mind. It wasn't that everybody came up with their own idea. Everyone knew what Paul was talking about. So what I want to invite you to do is turn to Ephesians chapter 2. It's on page 1,245 in your pew Bible. We're going to turn there. We're going to read this passage together. And then we're going to try and unpack it and understand why your footwear is important for your spiritual life. So if you're able, would you stand with me? As we read Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 6. Paul writes, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand in that evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Father, will you add a blessing uh, to this word this morning? May my words be clear. May our hearts be open. May we see how proper footwear applies to our spiritual life. And may we glorify you in all that we do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, there's a number of things that really make themselves apparent just with a, a quick reading of this. When we think of putting your armor on, I, for me, the last thing I think of is my feet. I, I don't concentrate on that, yet Paul puts it right here in the middle. He puts this idea of putting the right shoes on right in the middle, and what it reminds us of, I think, is two things. First being the long-term nature of this battle. You know, if it's a quick fight, you think you just run out and handle it. 
But no, Paul is saying you have to have your whole self ready for this because this is a long-term battle. Your feet are going to be important. In the Revolutionary War, some soldiers thought that the battle would be over before it was. And as they were marching to Valley Forge following General Washington, their feet are bleeding through their shoes and they are leaving bloody footprints as they go because they didn't think they would need the right kind of footwear for a long battle. We are in a battle that will be your entire life. Your entire spiritual life is a battle. And it also reminds us of how this encompasses all of who we are. Paul's talked about the, the breastplate. He's talked about the belt. Now he's going he's to talk about a helmet. He's going to talk about a sword, a shield. And he's talking about feet, everything. This is all of us. All of us is in this battle. Lots of times people try and separate out my spiritual life from my normal life, my spiritual self from everything else. There is no separation. All of you is in this battle. Your physical self, your emotional self, your spiritual self, you are in this battle. And we see here again that, that there's a personal responsibility of entering into this. When you go in, Paul says stand. He says fasten on. Take up, put on. The armor is provided to us. It's not your armor. It doesn't say take on Jason's armor. It says take on the armor of God. The armor is provided to us. We put it on and we engage. And we understand that we're brought into a battle day in and day out. In this passage that we come to, verse 15, Paul starts by saying, and as shoes for your feet... Shoes for your feet. And so when Paul says shoes for your feet, our minds go to different places. Some of you are thinking of the pumps that you want to buy. Others of you are thinking of the Kyries or the LeBrons that you need to have to be accepted in high school or your normal life or whatever it might be. Some of you want boots. Some of you are thinking you need a specific shoe for work, one that's good to be on your feet. All of these things, we say shoes, lots of things come to mind. But when Paul said shoes, in the context of battle, already working out this image of armor, a specific picture would come to the mind of those listeners, of those early church readers. And it would be the picture of a Roman battle boot, if you will, called a Caligula or a Caliga, depending on how you want to pronounce it. And it would look a little bit like this. All right, it was open-toed and often made of leather. It didn't and wasn't made really to provide protection per se, from, from the outside, maybe on the sole, which we'll talk about in a minute. But it was tied on, it would be there. And as you see on the sole, there are st studs. It kind of operated a bit like a football cleat. It was designed to give a soldier the kind of traction that they would need in open field battle, in close combat, in hand-to-hand -hand battle, so that they could get good footing, they could push ahead. They could do what was necessary in the situation. If you went in, as often would be the case with other armies, they would go in either barefoot or they would go in without good shoes like this, and they could be pushed easily from side to side in hand-to-hand -hand combat. It was common in those days that if you knew an invading army was coming through, you would go out into a field that they may be coming through, and you would put uh, sharpened sticks or sharpened stones just a little bit out of the ground so that as they would march, as they would run or walk, it would pierce their foot, causing them pain, rendering them unable to participate or easier to attack. And so a shoe like this would prevent uh, or, or would protect you from a, a trap, but it would also give you the kind of traction, give you the kind of a footing that you needed to prevent sliding, and so that you would be well equipped. And so this is the picture that they would have in their mind. Paul saying to put something on that's going to protect you from the trap of the enemy, and that's going to give you good and strong footing. And so when we take this picture and then we bring it into our life, what, what does it mean? What does it mean for you and I to have proper footwear in a spiritual way? It means first that we are ready. Roman soldiers with their boots on were ready to engage an enemy in hand-to-hand -hand combat. They were ready to turn on a dime so that they could fight. They were ready to take up their position. And so what Paul is doing is he is saying to believers, you have to be ready. 
We have to live in a constant state of preparedness. You know, in 1 Corinthians 16, Paul says that we are to be watchful. And in 1 Peter 5, 8, Peter reminds us to be watchful because the devil roams like a lion waiting to devour us. Being ready, having these shoes on, means that we're watchful. We understand that we're in a battle and we're ready for what might come. We expect things to happen so that every morning we wake up, we realize I am involved in a spiritual battle where this enemy is attempting to devour and destroy me. I need to be on guard. I need to be ready. I need to live in a state of preparedness. During World War II, people on the British Isle lived in constant fear and expectation that the Germans would invade. The Germans had invaded every other European country just about. Why would they not come across the channel to invade Britain? And the people of that island had plans. They were ready. They knew that one of the reasons that the German army was so successful in rolling through other countries is that their governments uh, you know, told their people everything's going to be okay. There was no resistance that came from the people. And so once the army in another country was defeated, the Germans rolled right through. And the British had a different plan. They began to send out leaflets and pamphlets. Be ready. When they come, when they are on this island, deny them help. Don't give them anything. Knock trees down to block the way of the tanks or the soldiers. All right, sabotage. Resist when you can. They had a plan because they knew that they were in a battle and that that battle could make its way to their doorstep. Are you ready? Are you aware and do you live in a constant state of awareness that you are in a spiritual battle? I don't mean are you afraid. I, I'm not telling you to lock your spiritual door and turn the lights out. I'm saying are you aware that there's a battle going on? Are you ready that something is going on? We need to cultivate a spirit of readiness. And we do this in two ways. First, know God. Know Him. Understand whose armor it is that we are putting on. Understand more about Him. See Him in His majesty, in His glory, and in His power. And it will give you the confidence to stand firm. It will give you a state of readiness so that your feet will not move. And knowing that he's fighting for us can instill the kind of hope and joy and love that we need in order to stay ready. Do you know him? Not do you know about him. A lot of us know about God. We can mumble off things. He created the world. He sent Jesus. I pray to him. Do you know him? We need to know him. But we also need to know ourselves. We're all involved in this battle. And, you know, and, in, and in a battle, the, the, the generals would get together and they would look at a, at a map, an old map, and they would see where, their, where their, their soldiers are positioned. Where's the weak spot? Where do we need to reinforce? Where do we need to be aware that the enemy could come at us? You know yourself well. Where is it that the enemy will find the soft spot? Where is it in your life that you are prone to evil? where you are prone to sinfulness. The, the Bible teaches that really inside of all of us, there is this sin. There is rebellion. We all are sinners. But each of us struggle in different ways. Some struggle in more physical kinds of sins. Others, it's more mental. For some of you, it's your, your temper. For others of you, it's your emotions. Where, where is it for you? Where do you need to be ready where will the enemy come? Know yourself. Be honest with yourself. One of the ways that we have here at Crosspoint that helps you to both know God and know yourself is that we like to study the Bible in community. It's important to study the Bible on your own, but it's also important to study the Bible in community where you go off, you look, you study, you prepare, and then you come in together with other people and you say, here's what I saw. Here's what I understand from this text. Here's what I am learning. Here's what I know about God. And so other people can listen and be uh, informed by what you have brought and you are informed by what they have brought. But then also sometimes people can say, do you, do you see this part? And it encourages you. Or 
Sometimes that bold person in your class might say, you know what, this is something that I struggle with. Do you struggle with that also? So in studying the Bible as a community, we know God better, we know ourselves better, and we're ready. We are ready for the battle. I can remember very clearly the day I dropped my first child off for school, like real school, took him to kindergarten. I don't cry often, and I didn't cry that day, but I wanted to because I was sending him off. And I remember thinking in the car this, is he ready? And praying, is he ready? Now, we're to our fourth child. There's no real praying or crying. It's just, you know, throw her out of the door while we drive by. All right, but there's a sense where you care about the preparedness of an individual. We want people to be prepared. When you're going back for surgery, you want that doctor to be prepared. When, when, when you're, you're visiting, you want preparedness. We need to be prepared. We need to be ready. We need to know God and we need to know ourselves. Now, as we, we move from that portion of the passage, I mean, we get the idea of shoes for your feet, but then Paul gives us this, this difficult to translate and understand section. He says, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. The readiness given by the gospel of peace. It's strange. It's hard to look at that and understand real quick what that means. That word readiness implies equipped, being equipped appropriately with or by the gospel of peace. So when we see the word peace, we're drawn in one of two directions, interpretively. We could say that this peace that Paul's talking about is the peace with God. That we're equipped to go into battle, to stand firm because we have peace with God. Others would look and say, well, this is talking about being equipped to go forward and carry with us the message of peace. To let others know about the peace that they can have. I don't want to draw differences between the two because I think one informs the other. And one, no matter what Paul, uh, Paul originally intended here, both are biblical. I think what Paul is clearly talking about is peace with God. We're able to stand firm. We're now able to stand firm because of the peace that we have with God. And that's our second thing that we need to be uh, willing to do. With these right shoes, we stand firm. Firm. The Roman soldier, when he had the appropriate footwear, could stand firm. As people are coming down the hill, he could resist. As he is moving down the hill, it would prevent him from sliding because he has the right footwear. It keeps him uh, where he needs to be. The readiness we're called to take up gives us a firm footing. And it means that we can stand firm and not be moved. That, that, that image comes up in Scripture time and time again. Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians 15 and in Galatians 5.1 that we stand, we're to stand firm and not be moved because of what Christ has done. And that's a key thing. A lot of times we want to get together and say, stand firm, hold to your convictions. Don't let this world keep pushing you down. Don't let them shove down your throat, whatever it might be. And there's some truth to that. But if we just always say, stand firm, stand firm, stand firm, we become a cheerleading group towards one another. We have to say, stand firm in what? Stand firm in the gospel of peace, which is the truth that you and I, if we trust in Jesus, have peace with God. No one usually preaches whole sermons on being enemies with God. That, that doesn't look well on the sign. People don't want to come in and hear it. Today we're going to talk about how you are an enemy of God. But Scripture teaches it really clearly when we read through the Bible that if we don't have Jesus, if we don't have His righteousness on us, that when God looks at us, He sees us for who we are. And being a holy and set apart and righteous God, He can't have a relationship with someone who isn't. And so we stand very very literally, as enemies with God. Jonathan Edwards, years ago, preached a sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Go read it. It is not one that you, you know, let's sing. It doesn't happen at the end. Because you realize where we stand against a holy God. We're His enemy. But, but for the work of Christ. 
because Christ dies and we trust in Him, then God, as we talked about last week, doesn't see our righteousness, He sees Christ's righteousness. So in that moment and in that, we are no longer His enemy, we are His child, and Scripture even calls us a friend of God. I used to be incredibly uncomfortable with that statement, a friend of God, until someone showed it to me in the Bible. Okay, we can go with that. We were his enemy and now we, are, we were his friend. We did not have peace, now we do. And because of that peace, we can stand firm. Stand firm. Have you ever seen people who just in the midst of, of chaos and insanity are able to just stand firm? Have you ever seen people who, uh, you, you know, the world is crumbling around them, yet they run back into a building, or they do this, or they do that. They have this sense of, of, of calmness. And that's what we have spiritually, knowing that we have peace with God. This battle is raging around us. The devil is seeking to devour us, to destroy us. Yet we know our God has won. And we know that we have peace with the one who is victorious, so we do not fear condemnation. We don't fear these things. In Acts chapter 4, there's a beautiful account of Peter and John in the early church. I love to read about Peter because Peter went from being this kind of goofball fisherman to one of, the, one of the most bold people as you get into the New Testament. And Peter and John are walking around. They've presided over the healing of an individual. Dale read from it earlier. And then they are thrown into jail because they're talking about Jesus. And the very same men, many of whom killed Christ, are now threatening Peter and John. And they say, listen, don't talk about Jesus anymore. We're going to let you go, but don't talk about him. And, you know, the easy thing would have been for them to say, okay, go off to another town and do it, to fear for themselves, but they don't do that. They say, listen, whether it's right to obey you, men, or God, you be the judge. But we can't help but tell others about what we've seen and what we've heard. We can't help but bring this gospel of peace and share it with other people. So we're going to go. We're going to go now and we're going to do exactly what we were, be, were doing. And they do that with a sense of peace. Why? Because they know that they can stand firm because they have peace with God. We need to cultivate a firmness, an ability to stand firm in our life. One way to do that is through, through, through the Bible. Reading and studying the Bible and seeing all the various passages where God says, be firm. Be courageous. Stand firm because I'm with you. One of the things that's been incredibly helpful in my life is to read biographies of missionaries or to talk to missionaries. You know, because they are, uh, a lot of times they've gone into very, very difficult positions and difficult places. And you read their stories about how they've stood firm in the midst of, of possible death, of economic hardship, of sickness that, that brings death in their family, all these things, yet they stand firm. Why? Because they have peace with God. And then, if you want to cultivate firmness in your life, you need to do difficult things. You need to do something that's going to challenge you. My, my oldest son is, is playing basketball, and I'm constantly telling him, you've got to do hard things. You've got to get out there and try to do that. Even if you can't, you try to do that. That will make you better. Go out there and play against the, the, the best kid. Try to, try to play against him. Try to beat him because he will make you better. You've got to do hard things. When I'm saying these things, I sound just like my father, by the way. And it's scary, but maybe not at the same time. Because that's what my dad used to always say. Go do hard things. Go try difficult things. It will make you better. The same is true spiritually. We have lots of ministries in need here at our church. We need some people to go and tutor down at a, a school through sore tutoring. We need some people to help with that. And some of you are saying, I don't even know math now. Uh, I don't think you want me to help kids read. I don't like children. Maybe you need to try something like that to push you. We, we go down to the jail. Maybe you need to go do that so that your faith will be challenged and your faith will be found to be more firm or firmer. What is it that you can do? Speak to your neighbor about Christ. Make it a goal to share your faith this week. And your faith will become stronger and firmer as you see God work. Having peace with God allows us to stand firm in the midst of the battle, and then it allows us to move forward. 
and to take that message of peace with God to other people. I don't think that we just simply are called to share the good news of peace, to tell people to stop fighting, to be nice to one another, that Jesus was a peaceful person, that he wants to introduce peace and all of these things. What we're called to take forward is the message that you're an enemy of God until you're a child of God. And you can't have peace with God. That's the message, the gospel of peace that we're called to take forward, that we're called to advance. The boots of the Roman soldier that Paul was talking about would have uh, been able to assist them as they were pushing forward, as they were advancing. And they weren't made for running necessarily, especially over a, uh, um, a hard surface. It could be detrimental to run in a football cleat on the ice rink. And that's what that would have been like. But it did allow for them in the field of battle to turn quickly, to move in the direction that they needed to go. And we are called also to be ready to turn quickly, to be ready to go in the direction that God says for us to go when we carry with us this gospel of peace. And so that means, one, that we need to be sensitive to what God might be asking us to do. So when you're sitting at a table and you feel compelled somehow in your spirit to speak to this person over here, go do it. Because you can sit there and talk yourself out of anything. I've done that. Oh, they are almost done with their lunch. They'll probably think I'm weird. Uh, it looks like they have cat hair on them and I'm allergic. I don't want to cause a scene. You can come up with all sorts of ideas. Instead, just realize that in the battle, God may be saying, I need you over here. I'm ready to use you over here. Come and be ready to move with me. For some, it's just moving from table to table. Sometimes it's moving from church to another church. Sometimes it's moving from state to state. Sometimes God is calling people who are 20 years old, 30 years old, 40 years old, 50 years old, all the way up onto the mission field. And you need to be ready to hear that. And you need to be ready to say, is this how God is calling me to advance the gospel of peace? Is this what he wants me to do? One of the things that's been helpful for me is to read, as I said earlier, some of the stories of great missionaries. There were two Moravian missionaries in the 1700s, Johann Dober and David Nietzschemann. They felt called to bring the gospel message to slaves. They prayed and they felt that God was saying, this is who I want you to take this gospel of peace to. So they let their superiors know. No one had ever gone to be a missionary to enslaved people. You can't do that, they were told. And they would go back time and time again. So finally they came up with a plan that they thought would work. They said, you know what? We will sell ourselves into slavery so that we can be with these people who you've called us to be. At that point, their superiors knew they were serious. And so they sent them. They sent them against their wishes. But these two men brought with them the gospel of peace to people that had largely been forgotten and ignored. And in a short manner of time, 13,000 people were baptized. Churches were planted in the West Indies that are still there today because two men heard the call, understood that they had peace with God, stood firm in that, and were ready then to advance that message to others. They were ready to do hard things, to advance where God was calling them. We can't assume, though, that this is only a call that goes to professional missionaries. This is a call for all of us. Maybe you've been put, uh, you are at a workplace where you need to be the kind of person that has the boldness to say to someone, I see that you're hurting, can I talk to you later? Maybe after work about what I know, about what gives me peace. Maybe you are in a family and you're one of very few believers and you may be led to call someone and say, hey, can we have lunch? Aunt or uncle, can I take you to lunch and just explain to you what's going on in my life and be able to really share with them about Christ? Maybe you're in your community and you sit by the same people or stand by the same people at every school event. And maybe what God is saying to you is, I want you to stand there. Stand in the firmness of the peace that I've given to you and now share that peace with others. Realize that, yes, yeah, someone might laugh at you. You may be, able, you may be labeled the, uh, the religious nut job or the weirdo or something like that, but that will be okay because you will stand in the peace of God in the firmness of his peace and be able to share that in difficult situations. We've been given firm footing in the gospel so that we can advance that message. So let me ask you this as we prepare to close. Do you have proper footwear? 
are you ready? Are you ready for the battle? And when we say that, I'm implying, is, is Christ the center of your life? We say that a lot here. And I think sometimes we don't really know what we're talking about. Do you have a relationship with Christ? So that you would say, this is the person who I'm trusting in. This is whose righteousness I'm wearing, as we talked about last week. This is who gives me peace with God. If anything that I said makes no sense to you, do not be embarrassed. I may have said it wrong, or it may be something that you've never heard. Find someone who can explain it to you. Everyone in here has been at a point in their life where they needed someone to explain to them the truth of Jesus. Don't be ashamed of that. Are you standing firm? Are you remembering the peace that you have so you can stand amongst the battle that's around us? And are we advancing? Do you have the proper footwear on so that you can advance this message? As we close, we're going to sing a song. And the song we're singing is a hymn written by a man named Horatio Spafford. I've shared this story before, but Spafford was one who knew loss. In the great Chicago fire, he lost most of his business, most of his livelihood, and he, his wife and four daughters were going to travel to Europe. Spafford had to take care of some of the, the work that needed to be done before leaving, so he sent his wife and four daughters across, and somewhere during that trip, the boat sank, and Spafford's four daughters died. His wife made it to Europe and sent a telegram back letting him know that his daughters were gone. Spafford went to his wife immediately, and as their ship, the ship that he was on, passed by the place where his daughters had died, the captain called him up to let him know this is where that happened. We're told that on this trip, he penned the poem, or at least the, yeah, at least the poem and the hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. When sorrows like sea billows roll, and he knew sorrow. One of the parts of the song that's always confused me is this phrase, though Satan should buff it. I sing it. I've always sung it. Frankly, I have no idea what it means. Some of you, some of you are, are with me, I think, in that boat. The word buffet means to hit with a fist. It's an old King James Version word. Paul talked about the battle that he was in, the battle of his flesh, if you will, and always said that a thorn had been given to him, a messenger of Satan to harass him. The word in King James is to buffet. It's this picture that, that Satan will come at us through clenched fists, trying to drive us out and away. That's what Spafford has in mind. Yet, he says, let this blessed assurance control that Christ hath regarded my, my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. We have peace because Christ has shed his blood for our souls. God gives it to us so that we can have a sense of readiness that no matter what comes, we will be able to stand firm so that even in the midst of loss, we can say, it is well with my soul. And so this morning, we're going to stand, and as we close, we're going to sing. And as we sing, I pray that this will be a prayer of your heart, because I don't know many of you, but I know some of you, and I know people. And we all have things in our life where we feel, where is the peace? Where we feel like we don't know what's going to happen, where what is going on, we are told that we have peace with God, that our salvation is secure. And knowing that allows us to take peace into uncertainty. So I hope and pray this morning that as we sing this, it'll be more than a song from your childhood. It'll be more than a song that moves you. That it will be your prayer in your life right now. Will you stand as we sing? When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with 
my soul, it is well with my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul, though Satan should buffet, though should come. Let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. Father, we are grateful for this day. We're grateful that it is peace with you that allows us to stand firm and allows us to say, it is well with our soul. As we leave here today, may we leave here ready for the battle that is at hand, ready to advance your gospel, your message of peace that is available through Jesus Christ. May we be bold, may we be kind, may we be loving as we share this, and may we do it for your glory. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.